Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us uh, this evening. Uh, we're going to have a fabulous uh, discussion this evening with two real experts on uh, mental health and the impact that the coronavirus pandemic is having upon families across Massachusetts and across the country. Uh, but first, I just want to thank all of you for self-distancing, for protecting your family, and by doing so, protecting everybody else's family, uh, especially the families uh, of our frontline workers, the doctors, the nurses, the grocery store workers, uh, the, the people who are our sanitation workers still coming uh, every single week, the policemen, the firemen, uh, uh, all of those people working at pharmacies, grocery stores, uh, they're just doing a phenomenal job but putting themselves at risk for us. So we should do everything we can in order to protect them as well. Uh, and that's how we'll make it through this at the fastest possible pace. So thank you. Uh, and, um, and, and I want to thank uh, my two uh, special guests here this evening. Um, we have uh, Tammy Govea. Tammy is a state representative uh, from uh, Concord and Acton and Carlisle and Chelmsford. Uh, but she's also a trained social worker. She's also a public health professional. And uh, I thank you, uh, Tammy, for joining us. She's also on the mental health committee up in the state house. Uh, and Dr. Michael Goldberg, who is director of child and family psychological services, but he's past president of the Massachusetts Psychological Association. So I thank both of you for being here. And uh, Tammy, let me begin with you. Can you talk a little bit uh, about uh, what you see as a need for a legislative response in Massachusetts uh, to the mental health needs that have been identified as this uh, pandemic continues? Yeah, thank you so much, Senator, for having me here today. It's really an honor and a privilege to share this space with you again. I also want to thank, thank you for uh, being a role model and, and showing off your mask um, the other day uh, out in front of in your neighborhood. Um, I know it's gotten a lot of traction on social media, which is very well deserved. I think it's critical that we, um, you know, and continue to engage in role modeling for citizens of the Commonwealth because I still see too many people who are not engaging in, in physical distancing and in the ways that we might want them to. So I appreciate you being a role model and for hosting these, uh, I think these are daily events that you're having and really appreciate the way that you're communicating with um, the residents of our great state of Massachusetts. In and terms of the legislative the way, response, can, they're, they're very... Um, they're, uh, yeah. Tammy, just want to say thank you so much. And uh, I'm ma actually married to a public health doctor, Dr. Susan Blumenthal, MD. Yeah. So she tells me <laughs> as a public health doctor, my job is to be modeling. I have to be out there uh, doing what it is that I'm asking other people to do. So thank you for that. And, uh, uh, yeah. and hope everyone wears their mask when they're out on the street. So thank you, Tammy. And, uh, and again, yeah. what, what are our needs? What, what should the legislature be looking at right now? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of things that I think we could be looking at and should be looking at and already are looking at. We have um, very almost daily calls, but well, we definitely have daily calls on a whole host of issues, uh, both in the Progressive Caucus, along with the Democratic Caucus, and all of the committees are meeting and conversing regularly. Uh, just today, with uh, under the leadership of Marjorie Decker, we talked a lot about behavioral health needs, um, as it relates to substance use, as it relates to mental health, um, of people who already had pre-existing mental health conditions coming into COVID, and how um, we could do a lot better in our state around making sure that we're addressing their needs on an ongoing basis, and also making sure that our behavioral health care folks have the PPEs that they need as they're providing care to their um, clients and their, and their patients. The other area that I think is really, really critical, and I keep asking the CEOs of the local hospitals, I keep asking our frontline um, healthcare workers as well as our first responders around mental health needs. You know, we have healthcare workers who signed up as nurses, as doctors, to take care of patients and to um, bring people uh, to a state of health and well-being 
and to save lives. And unfortunately, with the um, impacts of COVID-19 and coronavirus, and just how far behind we were in so many ways on testing and PPEs and just being able to keep up with the number of people who will become infected, I think we will see a number of people who, and we're already seeing it, you know, almost a thousand deaths in the state of Massachusetts. So really making sure that our frontline healthcare workers have the support that they need from their institutions to manage how they're handling, whether it's PTSD or grief and loss. And that's the other thing. So many of us, you know, our whole way of, of interacting and um, being in the world has changed so dramatically in the last four weeks. And that comes with a whole host of uh, mental health uh, considerations. And uh, so those are things that we are talking about within the legislature. I have raised these questions and concerns, um, as I said, to the CEOs of the local hospitals, to you know, frontline healthcare workers and first responders, but also to the Speaker of the House to say, you know, there's a lot more we could be doing. Um, and also, you know, there is a new effort underway to pay attention to domestic violence as well as it relates to um, to this issue and to the pandemic. So let me ask Dr. Goldberg, what what is the impact of something like this on human beings? Is, is it different for children and adolescents and adults? Uh, does it does it matter how old you are uh, and this whole issue of no longer having kind of person to person contact, but online contact being a substitute. Can you tell us what you're hearing uh, from your patients and what recommendations you would give to people who are um, watching this evening? Yes, cert certainly. And first I'd like to say, but uh, thank you. It's a privilege to be here with both of you, two legislators that uh, actually have a really uh, unique uh, knowledge and track record in understanding and advocating uh, for mental health uh, in the state and in the country. So that's a privilege. And uh, I know the representative mentioned that tweet of you the other day, and I would like you to know that uh, you've become a folk hero amongst a group of 20-year-old uh, Situate High School alum uh, who are uh, really uh, excited about your Nike high tops. And <laughs> I'd like to figure out what, what particular kind you had. But Air Jordans. And the air shortens, and uh, that might be how they're coping, uh, but uh, they wanted me to ask you that. So, um, but in all seriousness, um, your question's a good one. And I think I think the first message I'm gonna have is uh, really pretty general, that it, it, the reactions are intense, they're pervasive, but they're also very varied. And there are certainly some similarities that we see um, and things that are affecting people across age groups and, and, and certain populations. But one of the messages I want people to know about themselves and their relatives, people that they're working with, is that the reactions are in a lot of ways not necessarily predictable. Although we know certain themes, people are gonna react at different times in different ways. We're certainly seeing uh, across the you know, age span uh, you know, uh, increased uh, anxiety and fear and depression. Uh, when people have pre-existing mental conditions, whether they're substance abuse, eating disorders, anxiety disorders, mood disorders, times of stress uh, are associated with uh, increased, um, you know, exacerbation of those symptoms and those problems. Um, and clearly this is probably the most pervasive uh, adverse experience in my lifetime in, in terms of uh, you know, what we're experiencing across the Commonwealth and across the, the country. Um, so you not only will see different reactions from different people, but sometimes people will seem like they're reacting fine. And then another day or another time, uh, you see other reactions. So uh, certainly uh, there are folks, older folks who are affected in different ways. Um, than, than people living with their with their parents or their family, um, and uh, we can certainly talk about more more details of, as the conversation goes on. <clears throat> well, what is the what is the impact of not having face to face patient time uh, mean in terms of how a patient would be reacting to the conversation or the treatment that you might be uh, trying to recommend? Yeah, and somewhat with your other question before, but I would say before we can talk about patients in general, um, you know, in terms of social distancing, uh, we know not just from our current experience, but we know from research and looking at 
uh, uh, situations with Ebola and SARS and other adverse events, uh, that social distancing uh, can, uh, is, you know, is associated with increased uh, confusion, uh, sadness, uh, anxiety, for sure. But in terms of working with patients, and you know, the, the representative talked about, uh, you know, personal protective equipment for people working on uh, inpatient units and in, uh, you know, uh, residential facilities. And I have friends and colleagues that are nurses and doctors, and uh, that's a real, um, you know, a real serious concern. Uh, in my case, uh, I work predominantly with outpatient. Uh, care and um, you know we in our practice we've been doing telehealth uh, since 2016. We've been training uh, clinicians. I first did that with the Mass Psychological Association in 2016, and we've been training clinicians um, and providing telehealth services uh, for years. And psychotherapy and outpatient psychiatry really, uh, in terms of healthcare, actually do lend themselves uh, very well to providing services over video conferencing. But to your question, it, it does change the dynamic um, and everybody's individual. The good news is, is that there is actually decades of research at places like uh, the Veterans Administration and other institutions looking at the effectiveness of psychiatric services provided by video conferencing. And in general, um, if we take 100 adults uh, who come in person uh, versus 100 adults that come uh, uh, that participate via video conferencing, the actual results and outcomes are the same, that, that oh. people get better. That doesn't mean that there won't be certain people within that group that have trouble because of technology or, you know, providing services for a seven-year-old boy with hyperactivity uh, over video conferencing uh, can be uh, a challenge. So, Overall, uh, the experience is, is good. It's someplace in healthcare that is easier to adapt, uh, as long as we don't have um, barriers from uh, policy. Um, and um, in, in our particular practice, 100% uh, of our uh, providers are providing services over telehealth uh, in our 18 offices around the Commonwealth. Um, and, and would you urge would you urge patients to take advantage of that, to not wait until um, uh, until they can be in the office again, would you say do it uh, and take take uh, yeah. take this opportunity on telehealth to get the help to get the uh, the counseling which you need? Yeah, very important point, and it's not just my opinion; it's really based on on the research. And you know, when people are going through traumas and adverse events, um, you know, being able to address uh, feelings of being overwhelmed or intense fears or depression earlier on is associated with, um, with better outcomes. And, and likewise, I think you both know very well that in general, access to behavioral health services is, is a real weakness throughout the country. Um, and there's a unique phenomenon going on right now where, um, and this is, uh, we can talk, you know, we've seen this in domestic violence reporting and child abuse reporting. Um, that you know, because people are in contact with their physicians for regular well visits, um, and their you know school guidance counselors uh, as much as they were before, um, you know, uh, and some people uh, are sick or unavailable. Uh, there's actually a very unique um, uh, ability to access behavioral health services right now, uh, but I don't think that's going to last very long. Uh, you know, we're working with uh, healthcare entities like Atrius Healthcare and their 750,000 patients and providers. Um, and we're really expecting, um, I guess, a wave uh, of behavioral health needs in the next couple of weeks. So yes, sooner is better. Sooner is better. And uh, uh, Tammy, you're, you're like a full-time legislator with all the calls that you're getting right now, but you're also a full-time parent at home right now. So yeah. how yeah. is how is that helping to inform your um, your understanding of, of what the needs are across the Commonwealth? Um, in a really big way, I'll be honest, Ed. Uh, um, so I have a 15 year old and uh, they just started to really ramp up uh, remote learning, which has its own sets of challenges. And then I have an 18-year-old who we were trying to keep in Cal 
California where he was in school, but then it became apparent that he needed to really be back here in Massachusetts. And it's been a tremendous impact in terms of, um, and it's one of the reasons why I've been talking with constituents to check in on our young adults and our teenagers, because while they might seem like they're fine, there's a lot going on underneath that they're just not able to even, if they are in touch with it, they're not able to articulate it in the same way. It might come through as anger or seem like they're depressed, but they're confused. They're worried about their grandparents who might be, um, you know, in the seven in their seventies who are, you know, not as well um, health wise, their health status wise, or they're worried about their friends who might be homeless. My 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 older child has friends who are staying on campus because they don't have another home to go to. And so there's a, all of a sudden, all of our systems that haven't been working for people for quite honestly, probably decades, COVID-19 is making those issues, exacerbating them to an extent that we cannot keep up with, that we are not adequately prepared to really keep up with. And my hope is that after things settle down, that we can have a real conversation about what does it mean to have a fully functioning system that makes sure that people have access to food in their own home and they don't have to go to one of 1200 feeding sites that only puts them at greater risk of exposure. So I think a lot about our folks who are in gateway cities. I grew up in Lowell. I know what it means to grow up in a, in a dense urban environment and what the challenges are for families in trying to access the services, to access the food, to access, you know, making sure that they can pay their rent and keep a food, their, their roof over their head. And so, you know, to, to, to think about all the layers of mental health, I'm in a very privileged place, um, just where I am with my family. And I even see the anxiety level in our in my children in ways that I can't even imagine what it's like if you have a parent who's an alcoholic or a parent who is really just so stressed out about how to make sure that they are being able to take care of that family unit in a place where there's no place to go. You know, for so many families, they're really, um, the, the, tight, the quarters are very, very tight and there's no space in ways that we are accustomed to uh, being able to or go hang out with some friends um, in, a, in a public setting. We're not able to have, the, we don't have those outlets in ways that we used to have. And so it adds a tremendous layer of stress. And I'm worried about our seniors in isolation. I'm worried about my friends who live all alone, who don't have a partner or a pet or children who are, you know, engaging them in certain ways. So I'm making sure that we're checking in on our seniors, that I'm checking in with my friends who live alone. And it just, it come, goes all up and down, as you said at the outset, you know, regardless of age, this is really impacting everybody and it impacts so, Kevin, people in very Kevin, different ways. Um, Kevin, and we just need to keep checking in on each other. Kevin, you, yeah. would recommend, you would recommend that everyone check in with everybody just to make sure they're okay. And then you have a human contact, huh? Don't, yeah, don't assume just because, right, exactly. Don't assume that just because they seem like they have everything together that they are fine because they're probably breaking down somewhere along the way and could so, use that, that extra human touch virtually, so, uh, of course. Thank you. So, uh, doctor, uh, when I met my wife 36 years ago, she was in charge of Project Depression at the National Institutes of Mental Health, uh, working in this agency, SAMHSA, you know, Substance Abuse and Mental Health, SAMHSA. So, what's the what's the risk that we that we might be seeing uh, in this era where substance misuse might go on the rise. Is that, a, is that something that you're concerned about right now, doctor? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, we were expecting that, quite frankly. Um, and uh, there's less balances, there's less connections with other people that sometimes monitor that. It's difficult, more difficult to go to uh, meetings if you're part of uh, a program like that. Um, and and abs as I said earlier, you know, people who struggle with substance, substances 
are certainly um, you know, more inclined to have those struggles under stress. And, and obviously with diminishing you know, professional and personal supports um, and you know, seeing loved ones losing resources. Um, and you know, as the representative talked about, just in terms of our high school seniors and college seniors and all sorts of people who are um, you're not able to do what they're used to doing, they're losing uh, a sense of identity and purpose in a way that actually is associated with uh, more difficult outcomes from trauma and adversity. Uh, so yes, there's, there's higher risk for substance abuse and higher risk for all sorts of mental conditions. Um, I guess the good news is I also think there are um, a lot of things uh, that you guys have been doing as legislators that we're doing in the healthcare community that individuals can do. Uh, and one of the messages that I want to get out is uh, kind of like you asked before is whether you seek professional help or not, um, take care of yourself, take care of others. Um, and there are a lot of resources um, and, and a lot that you can be doing, but if you uh, you know, it's like how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Um, one, but only if it wants to change. So <laughs> all these information we give and all these resources we provide, um, they're only as good as uh, as people's uh, willingness and, and ability. And, and representative talks about, um, you know, uh, real life uh, barriers to taking advantage as things as well. So do you want to talk about this substance misuse issue as well, Tammy? Yeah, um, well, back to an earlier uh, conversation you had in this segment. Um, what I'm hearing is that for the most part, behavioral health access to telehealth is going fairly well in the state. The challenge is if you live in a rural area, and I think the doctor talked about you know access that are other barriers, but for the most part, it does seem like it's going fairly well in our state. So that really is a good the good news. And there are a plethora resources that people are accessing. I think the challenge is that unfortunately we are in the middle of um, both a pandemic and an opioid epidemic at the same time and you know the overdoses are still happening sadly. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about is that a bill that I filed um, last year um, was passed in a budget. It gave $150,000 to uh, the State Department of Public Health, and they have put fentanyl test strips out through uh, the police department so that people can at least test for the presence of fentanyl so that it's a harm reduction strategy. So while we are really focused on uh, COVID-19 and responding to the pandemic, we aren't forgetting about the other issues that existed before the pandemic became a real uh, focus in the news and our attention legislatively. So there are still programs that are going on um, we are trying to figure out how to make sure that people have access to the ongoing supports that they had. And for folks that are constituents of mine, they're reaching out to me and saying, listen, I have an addiction problem and I'm really struggling. Can you help me? And so just, you know, for folks who are listening, if you need to reach out to somebody you don't know where to turn to, reach out to your state rep, um, reach out to the senator uh, here and he can help get you connected to who your state rep is because we can get you connected to the kinds of services that can really help you through this. And I'm sure the doctor um, also has other resources as well that we could share. Um, but the programs are continuing. We're not saying, oh, not as much of an issue. It is, we know it is still an ongoing issue and the pandemic makes it even um, more challenging for people to maintain a state of recovery uh, and sobriety um, for all the reasons that we've already talked about. Yeah, can I ask you, doctor, you know, no one really signed up for this. This is just an amazing situation where our frontline workers are putting their own health, their own lives at risk and their own families' lives at risk if they bring it home. And they've never really been in a situation like this. So can you talk a little bit, if you could, doctor, about the mental health issues that you see potentially emerging for the doctors, the nurses, the police, the fire, the grocery yeah. store workers, the, the, the electricians and plumbers who are still going into people's homes because electricity and plumbing is still breaking and yet they're taking a risk. What are those mental health issues from your perspective and what would you recommend that we put in place as programs or 
recommendations that we would give to all the people who are in that community. Yeah, I, I think you're you're absolutely right. And this is something that's very much on my mind as I've been working uh, in the last 72 hours a lot on um, expediting training um, and access for uh, a resiliency program that we have statewide uh, for frontline healthcare workers. Um, but, you know, uh, I spoke to somebody in leadership at Boston Medical Center Emergency Department last week, um, and he, you know, he told me that their projections were 30 to 35 percent of their staff were going to contract the virus themselves. Yeah. And, um, you know, in today's Boston Globe, we saw, um, you know, the first death of a Boston police officer. I'm sure uh, there are other communities around the Commonwealth. Uh, there are 60, I forget exactly, 63 or 65 uh, active police officers in Boston alone uh, that uh, have tested positive. Um, and, uh, you know, I spoke to one of my doctors last night whose husband is a, is a, is a uh, firefighter in the Commonwealth. Um, and, you know, and, and I've heard from them, you know, the different uh, fears that they have uh, in trying to balance their commitment to their greater good, good in the community. Uh, but as police officers and fire uh, and firemen, uh, fire uh, uh, personnel and healthcare workers, etc. Their jobs are bringing them into contact um, with people who uh, either are known to have the virus or obviously may not have the virus. So uh, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of uh, ethical and moral dilemmas uh, that they're that they're facing. Um, and it's nice. Can, to can you talk? Can you talk a little bit about that, Doctor? The the ethical um, stress. That yeah, some I mean, of these frontline workers uh, yeah. uh, being exposed to maybe for the first time in their lives yeah. and what mental health problems that might help yeah. to uh, create for them? Yeah, I mean, even the ones that are used to it, like some of my emergency uh, physician friends, are certainly not used to it at this level of risk and this pervasive throughout the department. And I think, you know, I think the representative um, talked a little bit about this. I mean, the lack of a uh, 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 PPEs um, and insufficient PPEs is certainly, um, you know, certainly unfair, uh, but it certainly uh, causes increased stress and anxiety. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, we call it, an, uh, you know, a novel virus. It's new. Uh, these are very intelligent people that have studied a long time and, and worked a long time, and they're dealing with, uh, you know, uh, healthcare issues that there isn't really solid information on. It's changing every moment. Um, they are taking care of people who's, um, you know, can't have their loved ones with them when they're dying. Uh, so uh, it, it's really, uh, you know, the moral dilemmas are, are are just all over the place. And I'm seeing people who are, you know, once again, um, you know, having to choose, not choose, but having to struggle with their a commitment to um, caring for others and exposing their own children and their own family. Uh, so we're seeing nurses and healthcare workers um, who can't, you know, be with their children, can't be with their family. I have a neighbor who is living on his boat because his wife works in a nursing home. Uh, so they can't comfort each other. Um, you know, they can't be together. Uh, so there's uh, different kinds of isolation for them where at least I can be with my wife and my children uh, because all my clinical work is uh, through video conferencing. I feel very, very lucky. So is Paul may, I, may I ask, doctor, would you recommend to people who are now in this situation and having this ethical stress that they're trying to cope with right now, maybe for the first times in their lives, because they've never actually been exposed to the risk themselves and as a result of their families, should they be seeking help advice right now from um, mental health professionals to help them to work it through uh, at this stage, because it's going to continue for some time. Yeah, maybe. And let me, let me explain that. Um, there are a lot of organizations, a lot of uh, healthcare institutions, I mean, police departments, fire departments, other work, other organizations that I think are doing a really good job, uh, as the representative talked about earlier, is reaching out to people, engaging with them. So what, what I would say is that everybody should be talking and listening. You should be, you know, reaching out to people, uh, not only in your neighbors and your families, people in your organizations, checking in with them on how they're coping and how they're doing. And certain organizations 
you know, are providing, uh, you know, check-in kind of support groups for doctors and nurses um, and other things. I, I think if, you know, I, I'm not going to recommend that everybody who's under stress seek professional help. But what I, what I would recommend is, is for those who are really having high levels uh, of, um, you know, of fear, of, of confusion, of, um, you know, of sadness, of hopelessness, um, that, you know, those folks should, should really uh, start by asking for help from your friends, your support system. For people that you may not be seeing, your physicians, they're still there, most of them. Call, reach out, you know, your kids' guidance counselors. Some school districts are doing a really good job. I, I've seen emails from a lot of the school districts in the Commonwealth providing resources, making themselves available. And some for some people, out of sight is out of mind. So if they're not walking by your office or walking into your office, they, they, they don't realize that you're there. If, we know intellectually about technology, but for a lot of us, it's just not, not used to that. But definitely for the people, um, you know, you, if you really wanna help others, make sure you take care of yourself first. Your ability to do that will be stronger. And, and these are really challenging times. I'm hearing it consistently from really smart, really successful physicians and nurses and, you know, orderly, you know, people from every level of healthcare um, that it's taking its toll. Beautiful. Thank you. I think, and that's great advice. And I hope people who are watching take your advice, doctor. Uh, and Tammy, let me ask you this final question. As a, as a state representative, you are right there on the front lines. You have people talking to you all day long. Yeah. And uh, do you have a story that, you know, you might want to share with us over the last couple of weeks of somebody calling in and talking to you about their issues right now and the help that they need and the help that maybe as elected officials, we're going to have to put on the books to make sure that it's out there for them. Do you have, do you have any a story that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's something that, and, and, and it's, well, there's two, two aspects to it. Um, the first is it's primarily driven, driven by um, economic structures in addition to, and, and the stressors that not having a source of income right now has impacted so many of our families. And, you know, I'm grateful and I think many families are grateful for what the CARES Act has done for so many families, but there are still many families and workers that are left sort of out in the lurch um, who aren't really sure what kind of support they'll get from the federal government and what kind of support they'll get from the state government. So I have been consistently hearing from people who work in the gig economy and our small business owners. And in terms of the ethical dilemmas that come up, the story I wanna share is, I have a friend who owns a restaurant who wants to take care of his employees. So he has figured out a way to take on a second job so he can keep paying his employees so that they, they still have food, wow. you know, income coming in. He's already working full time, figured out a way that he can get some additional income. And he's going around and hand it, driving to their houses and handing checks over to them. And I'm hearing this over and over again from our, our restaurants and our bars that are already struggling on their own. And they're really working hard. Sorry about the cat. They're really working hard to take care of their employees who have made them successful. So I think part of the, the story is the human story of coming together. We know we're all in this together, um, but there's, again, it goes back to, we have a lot to figure out with the economy um, and how to get people, you know, really making sure that they're able to cover their expenses. And I think our frontline healthcare workers, while they're managing, taking care of people, while our first responders are taking care of the public health and, and public safety needs of our communities, they're also contending with what's happening at the national level and what has and hasn't been done and how that's filtering down. So I think the stresses are very myriad. Um, they're very local and they're very distal. And I think that's important for us to not also lose sight of in the midst of this. But the story I share has to do with, it gives a little bit of hope that people are really working together um, when you know we have someone in the White House who's not really working hard enough for us in so many ways, um, but that causes its own its own stressors as well. No, I, and, and you know, Tammy, that's, that's a dilemma that we have right now because we passed this big bill, $2.2 trillion, and the money for small business 
is not completely exhausted, but it's going down quickly because so many people need help. Uh, but we also put in 130 billion for hospitals and medical uh, care. We also put in uh, money to try to help the states and the local communities who are also providing services as well. So Mitch McConnell sent us a new bill last week saying, well, let's just take care of the small businesses. And we want to take care of the small businesses, but we want to put in tens of millions, hundreds of millions of extra dollars for the cities and towns and hospitals and the whole medical system as well, which are the frontline people. So we're holding saying, no, if we're going to do small business, they're critical. We want to help them, but we have to do, you know, what we have to do for the frontline responders. And those are the medical, that's the medical community. And it's the people who are working uh, in the cities and towns because the communities are hemorrhaging money and we don't want them laying off teachers or nurses or, uh, or police or fire. We need them uh, in the front line here. And we have to provide the money from the federal government in order to help them. So we're going to hold and we're going to get that done too. We're, yeah. we're not going to relent. We want to make sure. Well, thank you for holding. Yeah. Thank you. We, we want to make sure the whole system's in place. Thank you, Tammy. So let me finish with you, doctor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tim. If you have one final piece of advice to anyone who's watching this tonight, doctor, what is your recommendation to them? Yeah, I, I would like to end on a, on a positive note, um, to be frank. And I think we need a little bit more of that. Uh, we all know that this is an unprecedented and intense stress. It's affecting so many people in so many very serious ways. Um, and, um, but I also think a part of coping with this is, uh, it, it is creating some new opportunities uh, for people. And we talked earlier about kind of losing your identity. Um, and I hope that people can get a time and get past the immediate stresses, whether that's fear of uh, your own uh, health or, um, or losing uh, a graduation or a senior year. Um, and they could get to a point where, um, you know, they can make the best out of this. Uh, building on, on Tammy's story earlier, I spoke to a friend from high school this morning uh, who's been a waiter for uh, over 30 years. And he's devastated. He's got a family. I mean, it's been a nice restaurant. He did very well. Uh, college educated, and he's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And what I said to him was, Tim, I said, you know, you are a smart person, you're college educated, you have great people skills. Uh, hopefully this will end soon, you'll have the opportunity to go back to work. But, you know, maybe this will be, we'll look back and this will be an opportunity where you took advantage um, and made something of the situation. I see people, uh, myself, uh, I've taken advantage of exercising more. My 20 year old being quarantined with me has, has pushed me. Um, I'm learning better uh, physical health skills. Um, and, you know, some people are reading more. We're seeing, you know, there are also healthcare workers that can't do their profession. Uh, people like dentists and oral, my friends are oral surgeon, uh, but there are opportunities to uh, advance your uh, continuing education. And I realize that people who can't feed themselves um, or are in immediate danger of fear. I realize that they're not there, uh, but there are a lot of opportunities, uh, whether it be a new business plan or a new business venture, we're all gonna get out of this at some point. And with you two um, and your colleagues on Beacon Hill and in Capitol Hill, hopefully uh, we'll get out of it better than we would otherwise. Thank you, doctor. And thank you for that optimistic note. We're all in this together. It's one big family. We can see that more clearly than ever before. We're all interconnected. Uh, and I think as Tammy was saying, we all want to help each other too. And, uh, and out of this, you know, there can be a lot of positive experiences for people uh, that uh, they're going to look back at uh, and say, you know, that I appreciate the things that I learned during this time. So I thank you, Dr. Michael Goldberg. Thank you for being with us this afternoon, this evening. And, uh, and thank you for being kind of willing to be a part of your professional association, the past president of the uh, Psychological Association of Massachusetts. And to Tammy, uh, thank you so much for the leadership you're providing up in the State House right now to make sure that we put the right thank policies you. in the plate in place uh, for all the families of the Commonwealth. And we're not just the Bay State, we're the brain state. So we should set the model for mental health 
and substance abuse issues uh, for the rest of the country for the years ahead and the lessons we're learning right now. Thank you, Tammy, for your great leadership. Thank you, doctor. And thank everybody for, uh, for uh, tuning in this evening. Uh, stay safe, stay distant. We'll make it through together. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Thank you.